If you've ever seen or read Lord of the Flies, you'd be pretty dubious about a scheme called Kids Teaching Kids. But with no clear-cut answers to global warming, perhaps we should all be listening. From a childhood interest in a Mildura billabong, Aaron Wood has channelled his environmental passion into a book, a teaching program and eight annual conferences. Such has been the success of his initiative. He's currently having discussions with the UN about rolling out the program internationally. Good morning, Aaron. Yeah, good good morning. morning. What is it? Go for it, yeah. What is it? Well, <laughs> as you said, kids teaching kids, it's not Lord of the Flies. We don't just stick them in a room and have them battle each other for the one who's the fattest or the fittest at all. <laughs> but um, what it does is, is we actually pair them with an expert industry mentor. So what these guys are doing is they're studying locally specific issues which are really important to them and that could be a creek system, a wetland, whatever it may be, it could be climate change for instance. We put them with an expert industry scientist who is leading edge in their field. They then work for about six months and they present that to their peers in a way that they understand. So it's about taking these complex issues and really boiling them down into a way that their peers understand and relate to. How do you pick the kids? Because you'd, you'd want to have some pretty bright little muffins in there, wouldn't you? Yeah, I guess the interesting thing about it is it's actually open to, to any kid um, and that's we've been pretty conscious about that. What because, constitutes a kid then? Well, a kid constitutes anyone who's, who's younger than me at the moment, I think that's fair enough. <laughs> But no, a kid... So, so surely, you, you, you must target it to a, a, an age-specific Absolutely, region. yeah. We, we're actually from grade 5 to year 12. So you're looking okay. at, you know, around about 9 or 10 years old, up until, up, up until about 18 years old. Yeah. But it's open to Catholic schools, it's open to public schools, it's open to private schools. It doesn't matter who they are. It's actually about finding that passion first. So it's about the heart, we call it. And then we get the head through the Kids Teaching Kids process. And then the hand comes into it, and that's the action phase. So without all three of these, we won't see the sort of cultural change that we need to see in the environment. Why did you decide that this should, you, you, you should target this at kids? I mean, yeah. it's something that we all need to, to think about. It. Are, are kids more uh, naturally responsive to this? I, I just think that, um, you know, we often underestimate the ability of, of kids as change agents themselves. So, you know, that pester power that we talk about works just as well for the environment as it does for, yeah. I want that candy bar or, mm. you know, I want that new toy. So, so that pester power is really important, but also the fact that often kids are the very first and only entry point for the wider community to actually engage with these issues. So when you're talking about controversial issues, and I digress for a minute here, I've got to tell you this story, but I finished... Uh, Melbourne University, this bright young graduate, and off I went to Mildura up in northwest Victoria. And my role was to actually tell these farmers we were taking back their crown frontages, which ran along the Murray River, and we were going to manage them for them. Of course, I had my flash little PowerPoint, 65 farmers in the room. I'd got two minutes into it, and one of them said, how about we step outside and sort this out? So I had to think fairly quickly. I politely declined because he was a fairly big lad and I don't think we're going for a cup of tea, just quietly. But, um, you know, I had to quickly find out, well, what was the common thing that linked us all? What, you know, what, what did we all care about? So I actually stopped, stopped the PowerPoint and I said, uh, does anyone have kids in the room? And, and most of them put their hand up. Do we want our kids to actually have a future? Do we want them to be able to swim in the river? Do we want them to be able to drink from the tap and, and breathe the air? I mean, kids can't even use a slip and slide or run under the sprinklers like I used to when I was a child. You know, so it's really about guaranteeing their future and positioning us to take advantage of what is a huge global industry as well. Well, and it's, this idea is going global. Let's talk about the UN. What was that like when you front up to the front doors of the UN? Yeah, well, I must say I was, I was pretty chuffed and, you know, rang mum not long after and just said I'm now... But how did it come about? Though. Well, I, it, it was through a Churchill Fellowship, actually, and this is an amazing uh, Churchill, you know, Winston Churchill Trust, and they actually give out huge amounts of money. You have to apply for it. Um, you're then selected, and they send about 110 Australians all around the world to learn about the best technologies and techniques that are around the world and bring them back to Australia. So off I went with my bags packed and had a desk at the United Nations, and um, I actually spent three weeks in New York and um, three weeks in Geneva and a week in London, so it was just fantastic. Oh, uh, doing awesome. what exactly? Mm. Three Thrilling them with this idea, yeah. well, hoping, I mean, I hoping that governments will take it up and implement it in schools. Is, is that well, the idea? Well, I guess the, the premise of it is that, you know, we talk about young kids being 20% of the population, but they're 100% of our future, and that's all well and good, but they've also got so much to offer right now. And, and you talk about China, $763 billion they'll spend on alternative energy in the next 10 years. It's a huge industry. So what I was over there talking to uh, the United Nations about was this kids teaching kids methodology, and that's what our whole methodology is based on. It's a peer teaching methodology 
technology that's non-prescriptive. So the United Nations were looking at it and thinking, well, we've got these Millennium Development Goals, these yeah. eight Millennium Development Goals that no-one knows about. I don't know yes. if you guys know them. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, we're yeah, aware of them, but that's about, about it. it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the everyday person has no idea what these things are, and they're, they're great. They're, they're ending poverty, they're giving people access to education, mm. gender equality, all these sorts of things, and the United Nations went bingo, we can use this Kids Teaching Kids methodology because it actually allows kids from different socioeconomic backgrounds, different countries, different cultures, different religions to actually access and use this methodology. OK, but it begs the question, how do we avoid children being used politically? Yeah, it's a good one. And the thing is, with the Kids Teaching Kids methodology, we are adamant about them forming their own viewpoints. So with, even with their expert industry mentors, we Still actually... Still a research role, is it? Absolutely. Okay. And we give them these um, stringent guidelines that they've got to adhere to where they're not to direct the kids' presentations. And the same goes for, for our supporters as well. We've raised over $10 million to put this program on the ground here. And we have corporates supporting us. And people often say, well, so are you putting this corporate message out through our kids? Absolutely not. So we're very careful to make sure the kids are actually delivering their own messages. Just on that point, where do the two, where does the twain meet when you're getting a corporate? A corporate obviously wants to come on and get their message there. They want to get their brand on it. So are they, are they coming round to the idea that they should support this but not necessarily be promoted as a result? Yeah, look, I, I just um, spent a couple of days last week at the Business Leaders Forum, which was the announcement of the Corporate Sustainability Index, and this is all the big end of town, and, you know, we had Kevin Rudd open it and uh, Tim Costello speaking and Tim Flannery and all these sort of people. And I must say, the change in, in the big end of town is, is really significant at the moment. I'm, I'm How getting so? a, Well, I'm getting a real sense of optimism that they want change. They want leadership and they want direction, and that's where government comes in. But uh, you could really say over the last 10 years that corporate Australia actually led the climate change debate in the absence of, of strong leadership in this country. So the role the big end of town have actually got to play um, is quite significant. And the battle for, for our environment won't be won in our forests and our rural areas. Mm. It's urban land care that's so important. Mm. We're going to have an extra 5 million people in Australia living mainly in capital cities mm. by the year 2030. So the battle for, for our environment will be lost and won in our cities. You know... Well, how, what's, your, what's your reaction to the thought that uh, kids are being inundated with messages of doom and gloom about climate change? How are, you, how are they responding to that? Is it having a detrimental effect on some of them? I'm, I'm so glad you've said this because um, one of the key uh, facets of the Kids Teaching Kids methodology is it's based on what's called the resilient child literature. And this comes from the ghettos of New York and Chicago. And what it's about is that these kids every day are seeing doom and gloom. One in four adults are suffering depression in Australia. Kids as young as five suffering clinical depression. The United Nations, in my, in my time over there, have actually just released a study that by 2050, mental illness will be uh, number five in, in the number of disabilities and deaths uh, caused in our young. Gosh. So we've got a, a significant problem that we're worried about here. So framing that message in a positive light, recognising the problems but moving forward in a positive light is vital. And that sense of belonging and that sense of well-being is actually really important to, to the psyche of a young person. Uh, well, exactly. And, and it's something that kids automatically, when given the chance, do. Kids are automatically optimistic. Yes, we can solve the problems of the world, aren't they? They are. And it's, you know, it's one of those unfortunate things moving in at ad adulthood. And I've, I've got the same thing. You know, we, we start to become adverse serial, who's going to win ducks of the school, who's going yeah. to get the best job, who's going to get the most money. And what we need is a cooperative response to what is a global issue. And this is the great thing about the environment, is that in this time where there's lack of community and all those things that it's manifesting itself in, such as disconnect and depression, yeah. that perhaps the environment can actually bring us all back it together. It does, doesn't it? You see all the families getting together for, you know, particular... Arbor days or, you know, protect whatever days. And, yep. and, and it's a great sense of community all of a sudden, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. And, and, and I come back to um, the sense of community in times after World War and in times after natural disaster. That same sense of community can be replicated when we're facing what is the biggest war ever mm. and what is a global issue. As I said, you know, it doesn't matter what country you're from, whether you're rich or poor, it doesn't even matter what religion or culture you are, we all need clean air and clean water. So. You, you have these conferences, the kids... Take us through the conferences. The kids come together and they present what they present their programs. We've actually got eight of these conferences, would you believe, uh, this year? And they actually in Australia. Off, in yeah. Australia, we kick off uh, in two weeks at, at Flemington Racecourse for World Environment Day. So in Victoria, yeah. in Victoria, we've got um, three thousand students uh, each year going through the program. So held in cities like Adelaide and Perth and mm -hmm. Townsville, the kids come together and they research their topics six to twelve months prior to the event. Uh, and then they come together just like an adult conference. So we've got keynote addresses, we've got workshops and, and posted us 
displays. And, but then there is that on-ground component, so there's an environmental project day where the kids really get involved. But it must yeah. be fascinating to be amongst all these kids at those conferences. There must be a, a theme that rises. There must be... Is it, does it reveal what kids feel most strongly about? What are, the, what are the issues that really affect them? Yeah, look, the one you highlighted before is, is absolutely key and, it, and it's, it's something that they're, they're telling us every day. And there was a study which was released in Australia just recently where kids had to list their greatest fears. And this was a real worrying one for me and sort of galvanised and, and reinforced what we were doing. And that was that they had to list their top ten fears. Number one was death of parents. Mm. Completely understandable. Number two on that list was climate change in the environment. Mm. So our kids absolutely fear that. That comes through. Um, the other thing that comes through is they want sometimes want adults to get out of the way and let them. Yeah, yeah, I was just about happen. to ask I you. Bet, yeah. You know, and, and I reckon the great the great benefit in those conferences is that kids are much more inclined to listen to someone their age because if you talk to kids about climate change, they think that you know politicians have completely stuffed yep. it up. And their they? parents, we have. Mm. I don't yep. understand our approach. Completely to stuffed it up. Yeah, they. And I mean, I'm sad to say that I'm even in that group now. With some of the grade five, sixes, they're sort of pointing the finger at my generation as well. And I'm here we go, Generation X getting squeezed again from above and below now. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, look, it's marvellous work. It's a great yeah. thing that you've done, Aaron. And, and, and the likelihood of them rolling it out, the UN? Is extremely likely. We're actually running our first pilot event in New York next year. And would you believe, totally left field, ran into um, the diplomat from Abu Dhabi. And they now want us to present to them about running one in 2010 in Abu Dhabi. So wow, just fantastic. amazing stuff. Fantastic stuff. It's really great. If you'd like more information, jump onto our website and we'll have some links for you. Good to talk to you. Thank Thanks, you. Aaron. Thanks, All the best. After the break, chefs George Calambaris and John Savage will flex their muscles and set the kitchen ablaze, all in the name of the Australian Childhood Foundation.